my name is Christina Liu. I'm here to tell you about Tenzing Norgay. Louder, okay. Closer, okay. Bam. This is probably the most famous mountaineering photo ever taken. It is of Tenzing Norgay at the very top of Everest on the very first ascent of Mount Everest. And this is taken by his climbing partner, Edmund Hillary. This is a big history-making event. And while big history-making events like these are very important and super cool, the journeys and the experiences that lead to this are also important as well. Now, Tenzing Norgay didn't accomplish his Everest ascent on his first try. He tried seven times. So now that I've spoiled the ending for you, go to the beginning. He was born in 1914 in Nepal. We don't know the actual date that he was born because they didn't write it down, but we know that it was probably May because there were crops in the field at that time. He eventually chose May 29th as his birthday because that's the day he summited the mountain, which is pretty badass as a birthday. And he had a very happy childhood, but he grew up as a very, very poor Sherpa. His home <laughs> was in Solo Kumbu in Nepal. And, and that's where the, the pin drop is on this map. Now, I want to say something very important, and that Sherpa is an ethnic group, not a job title. I want to make that very clear. So, growing up in this village, <laughs> Sherpa Adventure Time, so growing up in this village, he heard many, many stories about the outside world from the other Sherpa high altitude porters that would come back to the village. And he was absolutely fascinated by the stories of the outside world, of expeditions, of, of people trying to summit Everest. So at 13 years old, he runs away from home and goes to Kathmandu. And he gets there, and he's amazed by the crowds, the market, temples, big buildings. But eventually, after about six weeks, he gets homesick, because he's 13, and goes home. He stays home for about five more years, and finally, at 18 years of age, 1932, he decides to leave home for good and moves to Darjeeling. He wants to go to Everest, and his intention is to go to Darjeeling and work as a high-altitude porter specifically for Mount Everest expeditions. Now, Tenzing Norgay's very first expedition is also his first Everest expedition. He didn't start small. He chose the largest mountain <laughs> to start. So in 1935, led by Eric Shipton, yeah. I, I do this because this is the only ship in the talk except friendship. Um, <laughs> so for this expedition, Tenzing Norgay almost gets less left behind because he has absolutely no experience as a, a mountaineer or as a high altitude porter, but he got lucky and got the job because someone didn't show up on the day that they were leaving. And for the British, this was just a reconnaissance mission to see if there was a path to the top of the mountain. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's talk a little bit about Everest. It was named after Sir George Everest, and the Tibetan name of this mountain is Chomolongma, which is, stands for Goddess Mother of Mountains. This is the highest point of, on Earth, measured at 29,000 29 feet. This is cruising altitude for some airplanes. Now, Tenzing Norgay's second expedition was in early spring 1936, one year after his last one. And the leader for this one is a guy named Hugh Rutledge. And this expedition from beginning to end was plagued with horrible weather. And we have these porters carrying these back-breaking loads of like 55 to 90 pounds while trying to climb up slopes, fighting snow at chest level. So with the constant threat of falling into crevasses on glaciers, getting blown off of a mountain with hurricane force winds, or just getting covered in snow with an avalanche, the expedition has to turn back. 
now 1938, Tenzing Norgay's third Everest expedition, he is crossing a glacier with two other climbers, and they're also, again, fighting through chest deep snow. That's what you do on a mountain. They suddenly hear a crackling sound, and the snow begins to shift, and they realize that they're caught in an avalanche, and they get covered with snow. Luckily, he wasn't buried too deep and manages to dig himself out with an ice axe. And when he gets out, he realizes that he was only about 10 feet away from falling into a crevasse and dying. So after this avalanche, they continue the expedition. And during this, he's carrying one of those loads and he slips and almost falls into the crevasse. Luckily, he catches himself with an ice axe and saves himself from dying into a glacier. They only get to 27,000 feet because they couldn't get to the summit. The snow was too deep and they just had to turn around. Now, between 1939 and 1947, there's not much action on Everest. Countries are not financing big expeditions on mountains because they're busy fighting Nazis and fascists. World War II. <laughs> So finally, in 1947, the fourth Everest expedition, and this is what I'm going to call the Bad Idea Expedition. It's led by a Canadian engineer named Earl Denman, and it's Earl Denman, Tenzing Norgay, and one other Sherpa. Expeditions usually have hundreds of people. So Denman didn't have the money, the fuel, the food, or even permission to get into Tibet, but Tenzing Norgay was like, I'm bored, sure. Um, so, unsurprisingly, as they get on the mountain, the cold, the wind, lack of food forces them to turn back, otherwise they would have died. Now, five years will pass since that expedition, and finally, 1952, an important thing happens, which is that Tibet is closed to all foreigners now, and all expeditions will have to come from the Nepalese side. And with Nepal, they were going to give other countries access to the mountain, whereas Tibet was only giving England access to the mountain. They were going to give the Swiss one year to try to summit, exclusive rights to try to summit. And because they were going to go up the southern Nepalese route, he was going to go past his old homeland. And actually, for the first time in 18 years, he gets to see his mom. 1952 in spring, he goes with the Swiss, and there he meets his climbing BFF, Raymond Lambert. And if you look at Lambert's boots, you notice he's got tiny little feet, and that's because, <laughs> boots, and that's because that man has la lost all of his toes to frostbite before this expedition even started. So this man is a badass. <laughs> so this is a reconnaissance mission, and even despite not bringing enough food or oxygen, they were just 500 feet short of the south summit which is 28,000 feet. Now, second time with the Swiss, 1952, late November or winter on Everest, they had to turn back. I mean, it's winter on a mountain. They only make it up to about 26,000 feet and he's really, really sad that he didn't get to summit with his best friend. Tenzik Norgay had felt that the Swiss had always treated him like an equal, an expedition party member rather than a porter. After 18, 19 years of trying, at 1130, May 29th, 1953, Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary summit Everest for the first time ever, and the first time anyone has ever done this. And this is a super cool expedition and deserves a talk all on its own. Now, this trip was not easy. They had luck on their side. They had a ton of lemonade, and they also had extra <laughs> oxygen tanks. Yes, lemonade was incredibly important for the climbers. Now, the big question that everyone always asks is who made it to the top first? And they both say almost together, direct quotes. Now, for them, they were both fighting for every single breath together, every single step together. So they didn't matter who made it to the top first. What mattered for them was that they made it to the top and back together. <laughs> so, while descending, they get mobbed by reporters. And Tanzig Norgay 
hates this. He hates all the attention that he's getting. People even end up showing up at Tenzig Norgay's house because they are convinced that he's the living incarnate of Shiva <laughs> and believes he's a god. Now, he didn't climb this mountain for money, for the international medals that he eventually ends up getting, or all of this attention. And he especially hated how the media had turned all of his accomplishments into political drama. To give back to his Sherpa and an Indian community, on November 4th, 1954, he helps co-found the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute. This institute is to teach Indians and other Sherpas advanced mountaineering and high altitude um, techniques. And he becomes the first director of field training there. Now at 71 years old, May 29th, 1986, he dies of a cerebral brain hemorrhage and his ashes are interred at the Himalayan Mountain Institute. And he is survived by many children and grandchildren who for some of them have also reached the summit of Everest. And I'm going to leave you with a word of wisdom, words of wisdom from him. The world is too small and Everest too great for anything but tolerance and understanding. That is the most important of all things I have learned from my climbing and traveling. And I want us to raise a glass or an ice axe if you brought it. <laughs> to the humble and the fearless Tenzig Norgay.